Hey, this is Tim Ritter, and you're watching Slasher Pepper, so sit back and enjoy. Enjoy. <laughs> so my first question is just the simple one. How are you doing uh, nowadays? You got uh, kind of crazy times right now, but... Uh... but man, it's all good. Just kind of rolling with the uh, situation. Yeah. And hopefully, hopefully here in the United States, you know, things get a little better in the next four weeks is what they're saying, you know, as far as the restrictions and all. Yeah, so, yeah. The only thing we can do uh, really is... Uh... Kind of like living uh, 28 days later. With, where's the zombies? You know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Give me some. Give me some zombies to kill. You know. I know. At least we could have had that, or, or uh, you know, some some albums to throw at them or something. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. And can we expect any new projects from you? Uh, yeah, currently I'm working on one uh, with Brad Sykes, and it's called High Fear, and uh, my segment's called. Um, when shadows come alive and it's kind of inspired by Wes Craven and um, a little bit David Cronenberg and it's got kind of a Hills Have Eyes deliverance vibe to it. It's going to be in an anthology movie, High Fear, and it should be out at the end of the year at festivals and um, uh, I guess, uh, you know, if they're doing that sort of thing, you know, with large crowds. Um, yeah. <laughs> it'll go uh, you know, probably in early 2021, I would say. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, the, wasn't that like a sequel That's to another film? Big thing. Which one? I thought I was. Oh, like yeah. Some. yeah, this is the third one in the uh, anthology series that started with um, High Eight, High um, uh, Independent. High Ind what is it? Uh, I can't remember the abbreviation for High Eight now. Uh, Horror Independent Eight, which was eight filmmakers, and then High Fear is the third one, and then High Death is the second one that just. Uh, yeah. Man, so many. I track them myself but uh they're kind of like vhs you know anthology movies inspired by that uh, uh, kind yeah, of yeah because i remember you um you told me about uh high death actually and uh it looked really interesting but i didn't know they were making a third one so uh, yeah. that's pretty cool we've been working on it for a while now actually i've been working on this segment for about a year and a half so yeah i mean it's a it's a shame that uh horror anthologies don't hit like the like a big worldwide release anymore uh because there are right. some great ones. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you can see them pretty much on Amazon, Amazon Prime, you know, if you have that. Um, I think most of the, I guess all of them internationally are picking them up. I know Amazon has different branches and, uh, you know, different territories. So. Yeah, right. And do you have any fond memories of, uh, this is, of course, a few years back, uh, from the set of Killing Spree? Killing spree. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was, man, it was a warm, hot, I mean, a hot shoot in August 1987 and uh, in Florida. So, I mean, it was great because we were kind of inspired by, uh, you know, Sam Raimi and the 16 millimeter shooting and oh, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, I like putting the camera on the two by four and running over the fence and doing those shots where you go up and over the fence and racing up the people and, I mean, it was a it was a blast, and working with Joel Harlow, who went on to do some, you know, this was his first movie as special makeup effects artist, and it was just great seeing him work and come up with all these uh, prosthetics and uh, foam latex gags for all the gore scenes. So, I mean, it was just a blast. It was a lot of it was just like a big horror fan party at the you know the producer's house. Where we were doing all this crazy stuff, and blood was flying all over the place, and. That kind of bit us in the end there because there was so much blood to clean up. Uh, from what I hear, that house still drips blood in the attic. Of course, Carol <laughs> Serp coloring. So, but yeah, I mean, it was the whole thing was you know really fun and also really tense because you know I was young, I was like 19, and to me a lot was riding on you know what what I was doing with that movie and you know working with everybody, especially after Truth or Dare, Critical Madness. It's kind of hard to follow that one up because it had such a big success as far as sales and everything. So, but it was, you know, it was, it was really fun and working with a lot of those people have gone on to do, uh, you know, a lot of other big projects. One of the camera guys, uh, I don't know if I can say his name right, but he now does soundtracks for um, Star Wars movies. So uh, he did oh, wow. uh, the Rogue, I think Rogue One and all those kinds. So all these people working on Killing Spree were starting out together and they all went, uh, not all of them, but a lot of them ended up... Uh, doing you know really big movies in the future so it's kind That's of cool great. of course Joel Harlow, he, he won the academy award a few years ago for his uh, alien work in star trek so 
That's great, man. Yeah, pretty wild, huh? And um, do you often rewatch the film yourself? Which film? Ah, uh, Killing Spree. Yeah. Do I watch it? No, if you uh, watch it often yourself. Uh, oh, do I mean do I watch it now often? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I don't usually watch my, you know, my own movies a lot unless it's, um, you know, with kind of a group where it's being shown somewhere at a convention or something. But I mean, Killing Spree is one that I can watch again. And also, uh, Wicked Games is one of the favorites that I've made, but a lot of them, you know, I don't watch. I've seen them so many times and edit editively that it's uh, <laughs> I'm pretty much no one's there i'm like going no need to watch oh, yeah. that again but some of them killing spree works and um uh, wicked games i really like the way you know that one came out yeah yeah i can i can see what you mean because of course as you probably know i've made some uh short films myself and like right. when, when i look at them now i'm like oh i would have done that differently and now i would have done right. that differently you know and I guess right. and I do end up, you do end up going back like with wicked games there was other cuts so i end up re-watching them and then we do different versions like for killing spree had a blu-ray release recently and um it's a different cut it, it was actually taken from the uh, original um director's cut which was just the time coded everything in the kitchen sink in it. and that the original cuts included and then the the time coded cut uh imported in from the beta sp masters is on there so it's an interesting cut but it's kind of really super long and everything in the kitchen sink is is in you know dolly shots where you know we hit something and the <laughs> camera bounces around a little bit all the the warts are in there and everything but the really diehard fans you know are enjoying it you know and so yeah, that's great and um to go back to the special effects who did that again uh you just mentioned uh like a big name now for Killing Spree. Uh. Yeah, Joel Harlow. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he yeah. works in Hollywood now, and he um, he is like Johnny Depp's right hand man. He did all the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, and, oh, wow. and uh, yeah, and he did uh, some stuff with Spielberg, and he recently did uh, the Hellboy remake. He was a lead effects guy on, on that movie. So yeah, because uh, the um, the scene where the with the nightmare. Where the lady has like these huge lips on her face. Right, 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 right. Everybody oh, remembers that. Was that. that like a big mask or something? It was, yeah. I was like, I wonder how we're gonna do this. And when Joel <laughs> Hollow read it in the script, I had it, I had, uh, you know, now today with CGI, you could probably do it a lot easier. Yeah. At her, you know, she gets above him and then her her mouth would open up and you just could see the mouth opening and opening and continuing to open. It'd be a cool effect even today to try that. And then her lips would like puff out and, you know, go over the guy's head. But he was like, on, well, the solution to that is we'll just cut away, you know, and then we'll come back and I'll have this gigantic mask uh, of giant lips. And it, it worked great. And I was like, going, yeah, that's great. And it didn't cost anything. We recently auctioned that off on eBay for uh, Ron Bonk's uh, shark movie. I think it's called uh, House Shark. And uh, it made some money for the for the budget of that. So it's kind of cool. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I. <laughs> That's like one of the that's like one of the scenes that really stood out to me because I think that effect is just so cool. Yeah, it is. And as a matter of fact, when the movie premiered at Cannes at the Cannes Film Festival, um, that scene is early on in the movie, and all the buyers for the movie got up and walked out. For, <laughs> <laughs> for some reason, I was like, going, well, we either we either have a, a controversial hit here, or we're not going to make any sales at all on this thing." <laughs> Wow, that's that's weird to me because like that's not even that. Well, 1987s or I guess it was 88 when that happened. So, but I guess people just had no clue what they were looking at. And they were, <laughs> you know, you're going to a movie called Killing Spree, and I guess you're expecting within. I mean, they say uh, they grab the audience within the first five minutes of any movie, which is why, of course, like the James Bond movies always have this huge. Yeah glued stunt at the beginning of each movie to grab you in and set the tone of the movie. Now, Killing Spree kind of starts off with credits, and then this dude comes home from, uh, you know, work, and, you know, this old lady comes up and starts nagging at him, and it's like going, oh, people, you know, they don't, it, it's kind of a slow burn buildup, and a lot of people, are, you know, you didn't grab anybody at the beginning. Then he goes in and has a conversation with his wife, and then finally, you know, you get this strange, uh, uh, 
you know, nightmare scene with these giant lips and people, you know, I guess they were just like, oh man, we don't have the attention span for this. So <laughs> Uh, the distributor at one point wanted me to put that at the very beginning of the movie. It may have been a good idea just to grab people and then let them know, you know, what's what's going, you know, going to happen in the in the future. That it's kind of a strange, surreal movie with, uh, you know, psychos and zombies and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, if they walked out with the big lip scene, just, I would have loved to have seen a reaction to like the ending. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So pretty cool. Um, and who are and were your idols as like horror directors or any of that stuff? Oh, well, of course, uh, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s, especially with the VHS uh, video era, John Carpenter, uh, Wes Craven, uh, Lucio Fulci, of course. And then, you know, I think Jess Franco is a big inspiration just because he just didn't stop and and never did stop and it just kept going and going to the end uh whether he had big budgets little budgets but he was just so obsessed with uh, you know movie making that he just continued to you know do it big or small if he didn't have a budget it didn't stop him and you know that's kind of an inspiration so uh john waters of course you know killing spree's got kind of a john waters type of a flair to it sometimes for, from his earlier works and actually i don't know if you've seen the movie serial mom it's kind of got a killing spree vibe to it and i like to kind of think that maybe john waters saw killing spree and was like going i'm gonna do kind of something like that with serial <laughs> mom he probably didn't but uh but they're real kind of similar to the way they're shot and structured and and kathleen turner's in that one so it's kind of cool but i was always been a john waters fan as well so and of course sam raimi wes craven oh, uh, right, you know yeah. Back then, and the you know it was the you know back then is like the the 80s. It was like the big, big thing to shoot in 16 millimeter and get something you know in theaters or or wherever. You know, and now it's pretty much DTV, direct video shoot on uh, you know HD 4K, yeah. whatever. And it's kind of kind of different now. So, but, yeah, that you know, was pretty uh, 16 uh, 16 millimeter. Yeah, definitely. So those those are some of the uh, of course David Cronenberg. Uh, all the canon about, yeah. movies, and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. So, and of course, Jaws that was one of my biggest influences growing all up. All right, you got that. the books on the back. And the Incredible Melting Man. I always loved that movie as a kid. I saw the trailers even. I was just like, "What is this? This guy comes back from Mars or wherever, and he's melting all over the place." And it was <laughs> a little film. So, so those were some of the earlier inspirations, I think. And um, what are some of your own favorite horror films? Uh, well, like I was saying, Jaws, that, that one never gets old. Halloween 78, uh, the early Cronenberg movies, I still get inspiration from that. As a matter of fact, I just rewatched uh, Rabbit. I, no, it was, uh, they came from within. And uh, I watched the movie, and then um, we, Joe Blasco was talking about some of the effects with the uh, parasites coming out of the mouth and, and the... Uh, uh, the people and, and uh, some of the stuff he did. And we were, we were reshooting a scene for uh, when shadows come alive. And so I was like going, Hey, what if we did this gag with, um, I was working with Michelle Macabra, the actress and special makeup effects lady. And I said, what if we do something like Joe Blasco did where the snake comes out of your mouth? So we made this snake puppet and had it come out of her mouth. And it's just kind of cool watching, you know, some of your old favorite movies again and then getting a light bulb on your head and going, oh, man, I'm going to do something inspired by that. And it's it worked out really well. It's really a gruesome scene. So hopefully people will you know, pick up on that. And, and then just other weird stuff like Crash. I rewatched that. I hadn't seen it for a long time. The David Cronenberg movie. And I've got some little tidbits of that in there so um but uh other favorite movies halloween 78 jaws horror of dracula and of course i love all the old universal you know movies um canon movies i grew up on those you know either in the theater or hitting the direct video whichever one you you could find and um uh, just trying to think what other great movies uh you know jurassic park that was a really really good one and uh oh, classic yeah yeah, for a monster movie. I'm just trying to think. I'm sure I've missed a lot, but uh, like Female Vampire, very minimalist, uh, Jess Franco movie with uh, just really cool, you know, elements using what he's got access to, which is cool locations and cool actresses and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think that like when when 
the lower the budget is, the more creative you can actually like get. Um, yeah. You're right. Also, you you have a budget, and then you think, oh, you know, we can do this with like special effects. But if you have like a lower budget, you can really come up with like crazy things. Right. You're right. And now, um, what's interesting is making movies now as opposed to uh, like when we did Truth or Dare Critical Madness. If I wanted to do explosions like cars blowing up and uh, like a shed blowing up, you know, you had to get real pyrotechnics people and all those guys worked on uh, Code of Silence and some of the cool canon movies and um, Sharky's Machine and, and those kind of movies. But now you can pretty much if you've got some really and I know a lot of, um, you know, really cool virtual effects people that uh, are able to put fire and blood and do cool, cool stuff like that. Tony Maciello is another guy I work with and he's got a shot on video website and distributorship and he's worked in the business at bigger companies doing virtual effects. And, you know, I can pay him a little bit to do some cool effects on this stuff. So I can kind of do what I was doing before with uh you know a lot less money like you were saying so it's kind of improvising and adapting if you can make the right connections with people yeah. who can do stuff you can pull off pretty cool scenes with almost no money you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah like for example um do you know the tales from the crypt uh movie like the 1972 one the anthology film yes yeah that's a good one yeah there's like this one segment uh, where just, yeah yeah amicus yeah. indeed yeah uh, they they made some cool anthologies back in the day, um, but there's this one segment where a car crashes, but they didn't, they didn't have the budget to like actually crash the car. So you basically just get a scene from the car driving, or like the camera fo- uh, they move the camera down the hill and then just spun the camera around. Right. You know? And like effects it like worked. that, are just so cool. Yeah, and we did that in a movie called Creep at the beginning. I was like, and we, you know, we had a pretty good budget on that, but it was like, um, I wanted to open it with a car crash, like you were saying there. And the idea was the one car ran into the other head on. And so the escaped felon gets out at the beginning. So I was like, so what we did was the, the beginning credits stop. And then suddenly while the picture's black, you hear a car crash sound. You just hear and then uh, when the movie fades in, the cars are already smashed together. And we had a smoke cookie that I bought from Orlando, uh, Universal Studios. And the car, it looks like it's on fire because this huge plume of smoke is coming out. And uh, and we went to a junkyard and got two just bashed up cars. And I said, you know, I had the junkyard guy tow them together and put them together to make them look like they had a crash. And one of them had a, a window that uh, was all smashed out. So we had somebody lay across the hood. And it was really kind of a neat because you just you heard the effect as a viewer and then you fade in and you see the end results. And then the bad guy kicks the door open, Joel Weinkoop, and gets out and then has a confrontation with the guard. And, and you know, the movie goes forward in there. But again, the same example is what you, you're yeah. talking about. So watching movies, uh, it's kind of where I learned how to do all this, just like you're saying with the Amicus one. It's just like you, you look at it and you go, oh, there's a nice shortcut. If I want to show a car accident, I'll just spin the camera and add some cool exactly, sound effects yeah. really that's the one thing i've learned you know doing these sound effects can add so much to oh, yeah. sound effects and you know, even if you have somebody with a knife and you don't have a, a budget to show the, the results and this goes back to john carpenter you show the killer go like this and then you hear whoosh, and then you heard a person scream and a and then you cut to something else and you know, you know sound people effects. understand you know they understand that you know that person just got knifed so yeah uh sound is kind of like 60 percent of the film honestly um with like many layers of sound effects you can already tell the story in and of itself definitely like That's- for example the cars that you just mentioned are crashing to each other uh, so what's the best advice you can give to young upcoming filmmakers, uh, like myself, hopefully? <laughs> well, uh, just keep having fun with it and what we'll just do what I did. And that's just kind of, um, you know, do it, go out and do it and watch these great, uh, you know, DVDs, watch what you love, watch the making of segments on the Blu-rays and all that. I mean, there's so much, I mean, when I was, um, you know, into this, you know, I hit all the, it started out with VHS and books, you know, I would read endless books on the making of, you know, all these movies, which I still do when I get the chance. But now, 
you know, whatever your favorite movie is, you can get on the a Blu-ray and there's probably a, you know, two hour making of documentary or like for Rob Zombie's Halloween, a six hour making of documentary. Um, you just study all that and kind of, you know, if you're inspired by it, then you just make your own riff on it and then, you know, just kind of network around and, and do your shorts and hopefully lead to a feature. And of course, another way to, to do it is if you go to film school and, um, uh, you know, that's a good place to network and get more experience, make shorts, and then probably right. actually make a feature film of some sort, kind of like, I don't know if it works the way, it might work the way that, uh, you know, like uh, George Lucas and, you know, all those people that went to USC way back in the day. I mean, you might get a job, you know, for, in a studio or something, you know, at a, a smaller level and work your way up. Um, I know a lot of people get to be second unit directors on bigger projects and then that and once you do that well for five or ten years you know you can end up getting a feature opportunity so or you can just right. with the smaller stuff and self-finance it or you know go the uh, indiegogo route and that kind of thing so there's many ways to do it but i think the key is just to be inspired enough to continue to pursue what you want to do right, okay. inspired by you know this stuff that inspires you whether it's uh, small stuff like killing spree or big stuff like jurassic park you'll you'll find a way to you know kind of do that and as a matter of fact the guy who directed one of the godzilla movies he i think it's the one before the last one but his big experience was making his own you know cgi monster movie and he ended up you know getting you know a big hundred million dollar gig so you just never know what will happen so i'd say just doing what you love the best you can and and getting it out there while you're pursuing other things and it's always good to have um uh, a backup you know whether it's something else you're interested in or it's something in the industry that you uh, you know love say cgi or whatever you know something where you might be able to make you know money while you're pursuing your other part of it because yeah, there's, exactly. okay. there's not a lot of money <laughs> you know producing and directing until you get to, you know, either higher levels or a level that, you know, where you've got a lot of connections. So, so maybe just so get yourself out of there. Lucky, yeah. One lucky break is, is all it takes. So, yeah. You never know what you come across uh, down the road. Uh, so do you have any final words for the interview? Uh, no. So, I mean, you said I could ask you a couple of questions. So what, yeah. what, what inspires you to, to, you know, you want to make movies, what movies inspire you to, uh, you know, do this kind of stuff? Uh, probably like Intruder. I love that movie a lot. Um, oh, the Scott Spiegel one, the, the one yeah, with the yeah. supermarket. Oh the supermarket. yeah. I love that. Movie. That's, uh, that's great. Sam Raimi and uh, Bruce Campbell making a cameo at the end. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's uh, have you ever talked to Scott Spiegel? He's pretty cool. He's on he's on some of the social media sites. So. No, I, I I've looked him up everywhere. I try to reach him, but I just can't uh, get in contact with him. Oh, really? yeah. He used to be on Facebook, but um, and his story is really interesting because he started out with Sam Raimi and everything, and then he ended up writing the uh, Clint Eastwood movie, The Rookie, with Charlie Sheen, and he had a huge payday on that, just writing the script on it, and I think. I think he saved his money on that and was able to, you know, live nicely after that. So there's an example of a guy doing low budget stuff. Yeah. Um, and he also worked in a supermarket when he was younger himself. And so do I. <laughs> so that's like oh, really right. inspiring so to me as well. Come on, you got to do a supermarket slasher movie, you know, could kind of put your own twist on it. If they let you use it, that would be cool. That's the thing. I actually loosely wrote like a script on one of my, uh, I don't work with him anymore, but like two years ago, I worked with like a super shitty boss and I wrote like mm. a movie that he actually was kind of a psycho as well. And then he just goes oh, crazy wow. and kills everyone. And I, I thought, oh, this is an original ID. There's no slasher film based in a supermarket. So I could actually maybe do something with this mm -hmm. later, you know? And then I found out about Intruder and there are seriously some scenes in Intruder um right that i actually wrote down myself which that's yeah. that's why i love it so much because it actually had like kills that i already could imagine myself and actually wrote down myself oh that's kind of neat and distressing because yeah I've, I've done that before where i created something and i'm like going oh this is so original and then you go to the video shop back then but now it'd be like streaming and you're like going mm -hmm. there's my idea what happened <laughs> <laughs> exactly well, you know what you might do with that, though, because Charles Band, uh, I think he owns, uh, Full Moon owns the rights to Intruder, so you could 
pitch him a sequel and go, hey, I want to do an indirect, you know, just an intruder too, set at a grocery store and just make him, you know, one of your characters like the the son or some kind of relative of, uh, you know, the guy in Intruder who went ballistic there. So that, yeah, that would be kind of cool. That's, you know? uh, that's actually something they discussed in, like, the making of. And all the actors seem really, like, interested in doing one. Uh, if someone wrote and, like, would direct one. And actually, I'm doing, like, live streams now every once in a while uh, where I basically just sit down and write Intruder 2 with some of my viewers. Uh, so oh, I'm actually what? working on, like, a concept video I'm like, what if this happened and then this happened and stuff like that? And my viewers can basically give me IDs as well. Well, that's cool. Yeah, yeah and like I said, full move. So you, you do something big enough, get Charles Band attention, and you, you never know, you know? It, they might buy it from you or finance it or <laughs> exactly. whatever. You never do know. So that's what's cool about, you know, doing independent kind of stuff. You never know yeah. where it'll lead. Uh, I don't know. I think you had mentioned to me before you're going to film school. Are you still planning to do that? Or are you just going to yeah. get out there? Make, are you going to do both? We make movies and go to film school? No, I'm currently like in, uh, not really in film school. Uh, they even like said the first day, this is not a school for like directors. Mm. It's mostly just, it's the closest thing I can do right now uh, with I, what I've done in elementary school um or like middle school it's kind of confusing to say all these names in english you know um right. but like uh now this is basically like more of a camera school so i kind of get to operate all these cameras and, oh, when I, well, that's... and when i finish that i want to go to the same school as um what was the director of uh robocop again oh paul verhoeven yeah yeah i want to go to that school uh oh cool the selection is like really crazy there you need to be like actually like really stand out to get into that school um, oh, but, that's cool. but i think with this school i kind of had start to others uh to go to that one cool well that's it sounds like you got a good plan uh you know i definitely wish you luck and i can't wait to see uh what you come up with it's gonna be cool yeah definitely thanks so uh do you have any uh final words for the interview no, nope. uh, just appreciate the uh, you know the the time and uh, always uh, honored that you know people remember the old stuff. So thank you for uh, you know having me on your um, call here or blog yeah, or for being here. just like that. yeah, appreciate that man. And everybody go rent Killing Spree somewhere. I, I, actually, it's Killing Spree. If, if if anybody wants to see it, it's on Amazon Prime. So you can, you can see it pretty much free if you got Amazon Prime. It's awesome. You should check it out if you haven't seen it yet. Cool, cool, cool. Anyway, that's it for now, and I'll see you guys next time. See ya. You're pissing me off, Roger. It's gonna be wild tonight.